Okay, so uh, mistakes I made when designing in presets and also some things we got right. And to understand that, I think it's uh, good to actually go back in time and uh, have a look at the history of implicits, how they came about, what were the, the ideas, the guiding ideas, why we arrived at the design that we have today. So actually the first uh, version of Scala didn't have implicit parameters, it only had conversions, implicit conversions. So in 2004, Scala ships with implicit conversions. <laughs> And why did it have implicit conversions? Well, at the time there was a very pressing problem, or so people believed, that was the late extension problem. The, the problem was this, that you have essentially a number of classes and interfaces or traits, and essentially there was this tension between structural typing and nominal typing. So structural typing said, well, the advantage is we can have a class implement a trait after the fact just that the trait has the right methods of the class, it gives you a subtyping relationship. And with nominal typing, you don't have that. You have to declare that the class extends the trait, and you can do that only when you write the class, not after the fact. So the late extension problem was, well, how can we make classes inherit traits after the fact? That was actually a big, big uh, uh, thing. It was also, for instance, a still unsolved problem for Java, but the Java designers were very much thinking about that problem. And so was I, and uh, the, I didn't come up with a good solution, really. So I went back and forth, how, how could we do this? And in the end, I settled uh, essentially on a very, very simple half solution, pseudo solution. And we say, well, yeah, we have this trait and the class, and they don't extend, the class doesn't extend the trait, but what we can do is we can write a wrapper from the class to the trait, which just creates a new version of the trait, and we can make that wrapper automatic. So, so were born implicit conversions, and the, 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 the reason for implicit conversions was this late extension problem. Of course, implicit conversions can do way more than that, so by now, this use case we would probably all express as an implicit class, implicit conversions, have other, other use cases that are not implicit classes. Uh, so uh, it's very, very powerful. It's also very easy to uh, abuse. And at the time, that wasn't really deemed a problem because we weren't really thinking much about essentially what do uh, millions of or hundreds of thousands of programmers do with this. We didn't. We had maybe 10 programmers or 20, and it wasn't really a big deal to, to say you have a very powerful feature that you can abuse. So the second step then were in Scala 2 that shipped about 2006, uh, implicit parameters. Uh, once we have uh, the basics of implicit resolution, so we had to find to say, well, where are these things found? How, do they, how, how are they resolved and things like that? It was very tempting to say, well, we can actually do implicit parameters as well. The delta is, very, is fairly small. And uh, the expressive power of implicit parameters includes type classes. So this was very tempting. So I actually found a talk I gave in 2006, and I just jump into some of the slides of this talk. Um, so, so that was the talk, poor man's type class. It was given at the WG 2.8 working group meeting in Boston, July 2006. WG uh, 2.8 is the working group for functional programming. So uh, we, we decide, uh, to, to discuss a lot of, uh, uh, these days we discuss a lot of Agda and, uh, and Koch and, 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 uh, uh, and, and uh, essentially these sorts of dependent typings and theorem provers. At the time it was sort of a Haskell camp and an ML camp and a small Lisp camp and I was sort of the odd man out in, in neither camp. So, uh, the, so the talk said, well, type classes are nice and the uh, cottage industry of Haskell programmers has sprung up about them. Should we add them to object-oriented languages, specifically Scala? So interesting, at the time Scala was firmly an object-oriented language. It didn't count as a functional language so much. Uh, and the problem was that it's conceptually expensive because we already spent the keywords type and class, so what should, where should type class go? And furthermore, type classes are essentially implicitly past dictionaries, and dictionaries are essentially records, that means objects for us, and we don't want to duplicate that. So the idea was to concentrate on the delta between OO classes and type classes, and that's implicit. So that was the idea. So then I introduced the standard example with semigroup and monoid, and I said, well, without type classes, what would we do? 
uh, we would uh, essentially write the two things like this. And then if you want to make a sum over a list, then we have to pass the monoid instance explicitly. So that's what we would do here. We would just pass it. And then uh, that's, that's the standard thing, of course. And then the, the idea, of course, was, well, can we avoid the boilerplate of passing these things? And that's when I introduce an implicit parameter. So here you see it first time in, on a slide, I guess. And uh, the idea is you should be able to combine normal implicit parameters. And the implicit parameter list has to come last. Uh, I'll get to that, why, why that restriction was there from the start. And then finally, implicit can also be used as a modifier for definitions. And then uh, that means that uh, these arguments here can be inferred because it will just pick the right instance here, of course. So uh, here is the fine print now. So to say, well, to infer an implicit argument, how do we do that? So the, we say an argument is eligible to be passed if it's itself labeled implicit, of course, its type is compatible with the uh, expected type, yes, and one of the following holds. So that's, that's the important part. The first that thing says X is accessible at the point of call by a simple identifier. I, it's, that it means it's defined in the same scope, inherited or imported. And the second says X is defined as a static value, so a value of the companion object in some superclass of T. So that's already the two different uh, resolution mechanisms. The first one is essentially the, the cu current context, and the second is the implicit scope of the type. That was number two. And uh, that's also sort of already this, this sentence, it's very concise, it's very crisp. Uh, as a specification, it's beautiful, but we'll see later that this, this one sentence caused quite a lot of problems of usability of implicits. It's bas it was basically a thing where beauty of the spec was traded for ergonomics of use, and that, that was sort of the beginning of, of, uh, of a number of, of shortcomings of implicits here. Okay, if several arguments are eligible, choose the most specific one, and if no specific eligible argument exists, type error. Okay, so then the other thing was uh, about locality, so that was the reasoning why we do not want global coherence. Uh, so uh, we can have, we should be able to have several instances of uh, the same operation at the same types. Uh, the, so in that sense, I, I was immediately ruling out global coherence because in a Java setting, the word global literally has no sense. If you follow transitive class dependencies, you pull in the internet. So, you, so even talking about global, you're not permitted to do that. So that, that, that's why global coherence was essentially didn't fly from the start. Uh, but now comes another thing, and I think that's actually one of the important things we got right. So here we have essentially coherence. Coherence is a loaded term. Uh, if you look at the literature, then coherence basically means it's not ambiguous. The compiler picks one instance, and there's not an ambiguity what it is. Uh, so, so that's in that meaning that it's not ambiguous. So one tricky bit is if you have a partially applied method. So you have a method. You don't pass all its parameters. Do you pass the implicit parameters at the time you convert the method to a function? So that's a question, you can answer it either way. You can say yes, or you can say no, I will essentially, I, I pass this thing as a method that takes implicit parameters. There was a predecessor of uh, implicit, no, I shouldn't say predecessor, one, another language used the word, Haskell used the word, of course, implicit parameters comes from Haskell. It was invented six years earlier, in 2000, but actually our implicit parameters only share the name. Uh, they have based very, very little to do with Haskell's implicit parameters. And that's one of the things where we actually differ. In Haskell's implicit parameters, if I give a type, essentially the implicit parameters are sort of lifted to the eta expansion. And for us, uh, the answer is no, we don't do that. We pass the implicit parameters at the point of eta expansion. And I think in retrospect, that was a really, really excellent idea. Uh, it, it, it avoided a lot of the shortcomings that you have with implicit parameters in Haskell. Okay, then you have conditional implicits. I don't think I have to go into that typical list monoid. And then I just go back and say, so in summary, what we had at the time to say, uh, and this should be well known for everybody here now, is to say a type class in Haskell is really a class. An instance declaration is an implicit definition. A context in a class, that means inheritance. A context in a type is an implicit parameter. A dictionary is an object. 
uh, and then, yeah, default method is a, uh, yeah, default method in a, in a type class. So that's a concrete member of your type and a method signature in a type class is an abstract member. So we basically had uh, the, the, the fundamental workings of type classes with this simple trick. Cool, so let me go back to my other presentation. skip forward. Okay, so I believe things we got right, or at least, at least you say things which, I mean, of course, you can make a different choice for each of them, but things I stand by to say that was the right decision, and we'll keep that, is that type classes are types, not some sort of sets, kinds, or some sort of other sort of sets of types. Dictionaries are values. Uh, instances can be defined anywhere. Local instances are possible. No global coherence requirement. And uh, the relationship with eta expansion. So implicits are passed in the expanding context. So that's a long list of bullet points, and I think these are all essentially the core of Scala implicits, which actually have a lot of advantages. Of course, it's always a trade-off, sometimes advantage, disadvantage, but I think these have enough advantages that we say, well, that's, that those were good, good decisions. But there were also a number of mistakes that we made, and mistakes in ergonomics, mistakes in, in usability. So I get to them now. Uh, the first mistake, I believe, was uh, that we defined implicit as finding this unique name. To say implicit means if it's a simple identifier that you can infer, that's fine. That, that's what the spec said, and not, nothing more. So you just you synthesize the name. Uh, you, so that's the one you, that the compiler has to guess, well, not guess, but derive what the name is. And then you put the name in the program, and the program should type check with that name. So uh, what that means is names matter. Uh, the name matters a lot, uh, and in particular that because shadowing is a problem. So if you have this implicit here, uh, and then we want to use this uh, TC type class or the type for, of the implicit somewhere locally where we have another name in scope, the A. Then here implicit uh, resolution will fail because it says, well, I can't infer the name A because the name A in this thing, if I replace the TC by A, it means this thing here and not, the, not that thing over here and it has a different type and it's not implicit, so I can't do that. So that is a problem in the sense that uh, from then on, everybody had to pick very uncommon names for implicits in order to avoid the shadowing problems. Names that were hard to pronounce, hard to remember, and that was sort of, essentially, it meant, it's sort of, how can you say, it's, it, you, you forced obfuscations of programs. You had to pick uncommon names for implicits, so the name was, was essentially worse than worth, worthless, right? So the name obscured your program. Okay, the second mistake with the same resolution rule was that nesting does not matter. So specifically it says it picks a name, it puts a name in the program, it doesn't matter where the implicit is defined, anywhere. It could be defined anywhere as, as long as the name is visible. And that means that <clears throat> we can very easily get ambiguities. So here we have uh, maybe one global implicit value of A, which sort of gets threaded through your program, and eventually would pop, uh, potentially end up as implicit parameter for this F, but here we actually chose another name for the parameter EV. So because the two names are different, you would get an ambiguity here. The uh, compiler would, would, would essentially uh, flag this thing as an ambiguity because it could be A and it could be EV. Uh, so that's sort of annoying. It means you have to have a lot of name discipline in our uh, .compiler, where we, where we use a lot of the same implicits that we thread through everywhere. That's essentially the context object. We take great pains to say everywhere it's CTX colon context. If you wanted to rename that to ICTX, immediately blow, things would, would, would blow up. You have to use that name. And that's a shame because it means that uh, we uh, uh, essentially uh, don't have at our disposal a, a solution to the so-called local coherence problem. So what's a local coherence problem? Local coherence problem is that you have a um, ambiguous implicit, like here this uh, F instance, which is both a monad and a traverse. And monad and traverse are both extend functor. 
So that means that if you want to then call, let's say, a map uh, on uh, this f, uh, uh, on, a, on a value of this f type, f of a, then it's ambiguous. You might want to the monad map or you might want the traverse map. And uh, never mind that monad and traverse probably have inherited their map from functor, so it's the same map. So there was a paper written about this by Adalbert Chang uh, at the Scala Symposium 217, where essentially he uh, points out this problem and then discusses pot potential solutions and, and the, uh, the fact that, well, there's, there's nothing really good you can do with current implicits and sort of the recommendation was a bit, well, maybe we do, we should consider global coherence. Uh, but actually, there is a very, very simple local solution to this if nesting is significant. So here would be the solution, the same thing here. It's a bit dark here, so that, that's a line that, that matters. That we could say, well, okay, so we have a bifurcation, uh, monad and traverse in this local context. We have to disambiguate. And the way we disambiguate is to say, just do another implicit value that says, uh, of type functor in this case, the common type class, where we say arbitrarily pick one or the other, pick monad or pick traverse. Usually they mean the same uh, map, but the compiler doesn't understand that. Since the compiler is too stupid to understand it, we just tell them. And that's okay. I mean, in this case, in this simple case, we could, of course, simply pa have passed func the functor instance as the implicit parameter to map. But typically, things are more complicated that this thing gets passed to many more functions and you don't want to essentially, and the argument m might be a lot more uh, complex. So this, uh, what you pass might be an implicit that has this thing as a small part. So uh, the explicit passing argument, the paper argued convincingly that that's not a good route. But this simple local disambiguation, I think, is quite acceptable for this use case. So where we say, well, if you have to do it, then that's what you do. But of course, with the current implicit rules, that doesn't, that doesn't work, because now you don't have two instances of functor, you have three. So the ambiguity only increased, right? So that's, that's not a solution. That would be a solution only with nesting. Okay, so that was uh, the two problems that were, came with this simple rule to say uh, if you uh, resolve an implicit, it's the name that counts. And I think that was, in retrospect, that was a mistake. Uh, the problem is at the time, of course, we did have no use cases. So what you do is you grab for the spec rule that sort of is crispest and clearest, and this one was, was that. But uh, then uh, something that is best for the spec is not always best for usability. So another mistake we made, I think, is that coming from implicit conversions, we just said, well, let's just reuse implicit for everything. And that meant that concepts that were quite different were too close syntactically together. So here are the two versions of uh, the first is says implicit def A, and the second says implicit def A, implicit X T. And of course, the two things are quite different in, in the use cases. The first one is an implicit conversion from T to U, and the second one is a, a conditional implicit that if you have a T, it will give you a U. So the second one is basically a, a, a parameterized type class, and the first one is a conversion. And of course, the two have nothing to do with each other. The problem is that by now, we are sort of uh, this, um, not pushing conversions anymore, saying, well, you should be very careful with conversions is a bad thing, uh, whereas we are very happy to use type classes, including type conditional type classes. Uh, but the problem is for a newcomer, these two things are actually quite difficult to distinguish one from the other, and it's very easy to make a mistake here. Okay. Uh, the related to that, to the sort of too similar too, too, too familiar with, 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 with current syntax is uh, the question of parameters. So again, because it was sort of the shortest distance from what, what existed, we said that a uh, implicit uh, parameter can be passed explicitly, and it's just a normal application. So we don't invent any new syntax or anything for that. It's just a normal application. Uh, but that had as a consequence that implicitness is actually a leaky abstraction. So uh, if you have here this function f and it takes an implicit parameter and then it returns some sort of function from u to v, so here it's just a function value, then if you would write f of u where u is, should slot into this argument, then of course that would be a type error because the u would match with the implicit. So it would say, well, you got, you got a u, I needed a t, the implicit parameter. Uh, whereas what you have to do in this case, you have to write f dot apply u. 
So that means it's a leaky abstraction. Implicit should be invisible, but here they're very visible. And furthermore, the way you work around that is again leaky, that you can't use nice function applications anymore. You have to use the underlying construct the apply. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's doubly bad. Uh, the, visible, the implicit shines through, and you can't use nice functional abstractions anymore. OK, that was the uh, number four mistake. I, there's one more, and then we stop. Um, uh, that uh, implicit imports were also too close to normal ones. It was the same argument where we already have imports. Implicit should, should be just essentially one additional dimension. Uh, let's just treat them like normal imports. Um, uh, and the problem now had to do also with the names of implicits. Uh, so we, we know that implicits have very hard to remember and to type names. So uh, that makes it very unappealing to actually use named imports for when, when, when you import an implicit because nobody remembers those names and they're very hard anyway, very long and, and things like that. So um, that means that everybody uses wildcard imports for implicits when you import implicits. And we all know of, well, maybe but it's a it's a common uh, theme to say wildcard I imports are actually sloppy. A lot of people say don't use them; use named imports only. And for implicits, we break that uh, quite in a cavalier attitude. You just say, well, wildcard imports is it? And if if name normal imports are recommendable for normal members and wildcard imports are a problem for normal members, then they're doubly so for implicit members because implicits are much more powerful and global than normal imports. So for normal imports, it's just if I select a, 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 a name, dot .foo, something like that, then I ask myself, where, where does this come from? Uh, if I have a named import, then the name foo will come up, show up in my import list. That's fine. Uh, in a wildcard import, I'm lost. I have to search a bit further. But for implicit, it's much worse because this foo uh, could be used anywhere in my program, right? I don't even see the application, and I don't see where it comes from. And that, that leads to this sort of mythical, mystical uh, programming where with a single little switch, uh, I have a mode change for my whole, whole program, and everything either works or doesn't. Uh, it also encourages, this, this simple thing encourages an abuse that uh, there's a lot of uh, people who design libraries that are very, very powerful, that fundamentally change what your program does, and then it's all uh, very convenient and tempting to just say, well, just use my library, dot underscore, and your whole world changes for your code. But for the end user, that's a problem, in particular if they pull in several libraries that all have this sort of godlike attitude, and then they have to live with the fallout of the feature interactions. OK, so cool for library writers, sometimes not so cool for end users of those libraries. So if you take the criticism together, then I think, so the historically implicit started as a way to express conversions. And we generalized the mechanism to uh, resolve conversions to provide type classes, extension methods, and many other kinds of contextual information. What's amazing is that this simple mechanism did so much and had so many different use cases, so immensely powerful. But the problem is that the mechanism tends to hide intent and the overall architecture. It's too much mechanism and not enough intent for the usability. And that also led to the fact that implicits are positively scary for, for a lot of people, in particular people that get dropped into a foreign code, code base where they do not know what, what kind of implicits get used here. OK, so if we look at the design principles, then uh, I think we have to sort of come back, and Miles is smiling, to say the core concept is term inference. Uh, so that uh, is um, what, what's it all about, really, that we say. The, the, similar to, to we, are, we know type inference, so types get inferred from the context. Uh, we now have a way to synthesize terms or to infer terms. So that's, that's the standard thing. And that's sort of the thing that's missing in Haskell, because in Haskell, these dictionaries are not terms. There's something. So you, you, you use some sort of higher order cloud, cloud thing. But, but in Scala, it's very concrete. You infer a term that you can write down and that you can pass explicitly. So it's really the missing, missing bit here. Um, and how do you infer a term? Well, you give a type. Uh, that's the a, that's a type of the term that you want. And then implicit search happens and it will synthesize that term. So um, what we want is that instead of adding implicit as a modifier to many different constructs, vars, vars, defs, objects, class, 
uh, and e changing the meaning of each in slightly different ways, we want to have a single construct that essentially introduces this principle. So instead of having a modifier with feature interactions for everything, we have a single con construct that says, this is a term that you can infer for this type. And we call these terms, after lots of agony and deliberation, delegates. So delegates is the name. So let me introduce delegates. So here is the uh, probably standard first example of any type class. It's ordering with ints and lists. Uh, so here we have our ordered uh, trait with a compare method, which is abstract and less than and greater than extension methods, which uh, use these things. So that uses another thing in Scala 3, extension methods, which are written like this. So the, the thing you dispatch on the left operand is written to the left of the operator or method name. And then you have a delegate int ord for ordered of int, where you have to define the abstract method like this. And then you have a delegate, for instance, list ord, which would be the delegate for ord of list of t. But for that one, you need another delegate, uh, and that's passed with a given clause. So uh, given an ordering for ord of t, you have an ordering for list of ordered uh, list of t, and I left out the implementation of the compare method. So that re will replace implicit as a modifier, and it's very clearly it expresses the intent instead of the mechanism. Some people have, have said, well, write instance instead of the delegate, and then it really looks very much like a Haskell instance, that definition. Uh, the problem was that instance, somebody else then said, well, no, you can't take instance. You already took objects to uh, let, let, let me talk about these values that, uh, that, that are. Now, if you take instance as well, I'm, I, I don't have anything left, so you can't use instance. So uh, in the end, it was delegate that we used. So let me go on a little bit with the, uh, to, to introduce them. Uh, the, these delegates, because I said, well, these names of the implicits, hey, they, these terms, they are inferred automatically. So why do, do the names of these things even matter? They don't. I mean, a compiler can synthesize a name. So indeed, names don't matter. Uh, you, can, you can write them, uh, like here, which is good for documentation, and it's good for binary stability and debuggability, uh, that you say, I want this name to be always the same thing, uh, then uh, that, that's fine. And uh, if you want to trace these things in a debugger, well, you know what they're called. So for these reasons, they're good. Uh, but you can, if you don't care for that, you can also leave them out. So here you have just a delegate for order of int, a delegate t for order of list of t, and you can leave them out from the parameters as well. You just say, given an uh, order of t. So delegates can be anonymous. Um, if you leave out the name, then the compiler will synthesize one. So for this one here, for instance, it would, would synthesize the name ord underscore int underscore delegate. So that would be the principle here. It would be ord underscore list underscore delegate. So it would only go one level deep. And sometimes you get conflicts because you want to have two delegates that are too close together. And yeah, hey, then you give, you, you give the name yourself. But it happens not, not that often. Okay, <clears throat> so um, delegates can also be aliases, uh, and with that we have actually the same fundamental power of uh, original implicits. Uh, so here we would say, uh, let's say a delegate uh, for execution context, the global one, uh, would be a new fork join pool. Uh, here we have one for position, and uh, these aliases can of course also be conditional, so we have a delegate for context given an outer context which says, it's the outer context with, let's say, a different owner or something like that. So you can do all these things. And the principle uh, is essentially if there's something you can do with current implicits, a lazy val, an abstract implicit that's overwritten by another one and things like that, the guiding principle is, is always do exactly that but with normal values. Just use normal defs, normal vals, They're not, not implicit. So essentially you set up your system on one axis and on, on the other axis you said, well, now let me take this definition and make it inferable using a delegate, which is then often an alias delegate. So instead of saying I can put implicit as a modifier into everything, I say, write it as you did without implicit and then bring it into the term inference as a delegate. It's a different principle of organization, but it's, it's roughly as com but, uh, compact. Some, some things are, uh, uh, most things are a lot more compact. Some things are two tokens longer or things like that. It doesn't really matter. But it's sort of the, uh, a, a different thing that we say we separate this idea of setting up an architecture for term and making these terms eligible for, uh, type for term inference. 
Okay, um, the, uh, I, you've already seen a given clause, so uh, the design principle for these implicit parameters then is instead of treating them as normal parameters, you have a separate construct to define and pass uh, these implicit parameters. And that contract, construct uses given uh, for, its, uh, for in both the application side and the definition side. So let's see some code. Oops. Yeah, okay. So let's see some code. Uh, so we have a, a maximum function here. Uh, and that needs an ordering, so that's, that's this thing here, and that's just uh, the maximum. So you can, of course, call it uh, with, uh, without passing the ordering, then it will be inferred uh, from what we have seen before. And if you want to pass it, then you have to use, again, given. So max 2, 3, given, int ord uh, is, uh, uh, it passes an explicit ordering, and here we have uh, for the list, if you want to, pass an explicit ordering, we can say given list ord, which would infer the, the argument, or we, we can go all the way to, to the leaves and say given int list ord, given int ord. So that's how you pass these things. It's very explicit that this is an application of an, uh, of, of a, uh, uh, of, uh, an implicit parameter. So application of an implicit parameter is very explicit. And that's important because there is essentially only a limited implicit budget that you have for usability. So since implicits are already very powerful, everything else that surrounds them has to be super, super explicit. No, no choice allowed because that would just essentially um, uh, explode your, your choice space. So what you cannot write anymore is max 2, 3, int ord. That would be an error. And for the same reason, then, you get for free the thing that I showed you before, uh, this one here, uh, uh, that one, uh, would, of course, work because it would say, well, F, uh, there's no given given. So uh, if that is a given uh, class, uh, a new, new style implicit parameter, then it would be clear that the U applies to that thing here and not to that thing over there. Because if I wanted to pass the thing over there, I would have had to use a given class. So that's the payback that you get from that. Okay, um, good, uh, that was this, yeah. Okay, so let's see how it all hangs together doing some type classes in the new style. So uh, here's the, uh, my semi-group monoid again. So here's the, uh, the setup of the two traits. And then I would say a delegate for monoid of string is uh, I uh, define combine as an extension method uh, like this, and I define the unit like this. So this actually works super smoothly, uh, essentially because of the interaction of extension methods and implicits. You can see this uh, down here in the sum uh, example. So sum takes a type uh, t that must be a monoid, that must have a monoid instance and a list of t's, and it then just does a fold left of the monoid of t unit. So that is the same as implicitly, but like in shapeless, it gives you the better type. It gives you the type that it inferred, not the type that was demanded. Uh, so the monoid of T of units, so that would give you essentially the, the, the right monoid for that. And then you call the combined method, uh, so then you pass the combined method as the uh, uh, function argument, as the operator argument to fold left. So why does this work? Well, it works because, so T colon monoid means we have a monoid instance in scope. Uh, and the rules for extension methods say, well, if you, if you have a type that has an extension method like combine, and you have an implicit instance in scope for this thing, then the extension method is applicable. So usually with extension methods, says you have to import them somehow. But we have this essentially tight interaction with implicits. And that is a big help, because that means you don't have to use simulacrum or any of these things with decorators and essentially set up your infix operators and things like that. All this is gone. It's, it's in your type classes itself. It works out of the box. OK, let's uh, just see how that works for higher kinded. So here we have functor. And monad, uh, typical operations with map and flat map and pure. And uh, here's uh, our uh, list monad that actually defines these things. So it generalizes readily to higher kinds. OK, so coming back to the origin, origin of it all, what about implicit conversions? Uh, in fact, what we propose is to drop implicit conversions as a separate syntactic construct. So it will be gone, like all other uses of implicits. And what we will keep, uh, because, well, uh, some people 
Oh, no. some, some, some software just demands an implicit conversion. Uh, in, in basically every language has one way to, to, def to set these things up. So what we will do is we will have a standard uh, type class called conversion, uh, two parameter type class, conversion from two. And uh, you can uh, write a delegate for the type class, and that will give you the conversion. So instances, uh, the delegates of, for these type classes are your implicit conversion. So here you would one, do one from string to token. You would say, well, uh, it, the conversion is, uh, has an apply method. Uh, it's a, uh, so uh, you define the apply method. Uh, to, to, to do what it should do, and uh, that's the way you set it up. The advantage is that there won't be any more tutorials that say, uh, let's start with implicits and let's start with implicit conversions, like they almost all do today, which is a terrible mistake because we all know in, in conversions lead you astray. That's essentially a dead end for, for conversions. Uh, you can't do that because conversions are delegates, so before you can explain conversions, you have to explain delegates. So by the time, hopefully, the attention of the reader is already lower and uh, it, comes, it comes later. There's a, there's a nicer way to do it for, as, as an alias delegate just for completeness. You can write delegate for conversion string token equals new keyword underscore. And that was, would use essentially the fact that conversion is a SAM type, a uh, single abstract method type. So that's a SAM conversion here technically, that you have a function lambda that gets lifted into a single abstract method type. So you can write it like that as well. Okay, and finally, uh, let's look at, have a look at the imports. So instead of importing implicits like normal definitions, we want to have a special construct for them for importing them. So here's the, uh, the sort of the schematic. Uh, if you have an object and it has, let's say, a delegate TC, and it has a normal uh, member F, then if I write import a dot underscore, I will only get the F. I won't get the delegate. And if I write import delegate a dot underscore, I will get, uh, only get the delegate. So that would import TC and not F. So that is already better than what we had because now it's clear when we look at a, at a code, these import delegates, they should stick out. So you, typically you will have maybe 50 imports and nobody scans them, but you might have only two or three delegate imports. And uh, those typically, the, there would be a tendency to just group them somewhere and then you could easily say, okay, this gets implicit from here, 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 so I, I, that's, I better be aware of that and I have already formed a picture what this does. Uh, but we can actually go further because the, I, the, the problem, again, to say for delegates or for implicits, we need wildcard imports. So that's still bad, but uh, the problem is we can't use a named import because names matter even less than before. Uh, names, delegates can be anonymous, so you, can, you cannot, you cannot uh, call them by the name. But what matters for a delegate? Well, the type, right? It's type, that's what matters. So what we will... Uh, what we also have is a way to import delegates by type. So, for instance, you could have this, these uh, type class instances, these delegates, int ORT, list ORT, EC for execution context, and then IM for a monoid. And what you could say, an import delegate instances, and then you just say for ordering, underscore. So that gives you uh, essentially everything that conforms to this type, which, can, as you see, can have wildcards. So that would give you here int ORT and list ORT. That's the two delegates that actually match an ordering. Or you could write uh, uh, for import delegate instances IM, so that's a named one, you can mix them, and then for execution context, then that would import IM by name and EC by type, because EC is your delegate for execution context. So there are many improvements in details, so Delegates and implicit parameters can be anonymous. Nesting is significant. We've seen those. Shadowing is eliminated. Uh, the import scope has been uh, restricted to not no longer. Uh, uh, sorry, the implicit scope has been restricted to no, no longer include package objects. Uh, prioritization is is a lot more robust. It's not dependent anymore, or well, you can still, for backwards compatibility, you can still use essentially the class hierarchy for that, but there are now better, better ways to do it. And the error messages have become much better. The hardest thing actually was, was naming them. Uh, and in fact, we went back and forth. Uh, so the design of uh, the delegates has been solid for the last six months about. But uh, the, the name, we went back and forth. My original proposal was witness. Uh, which uh, is sort of a witness for a type uh, or this uh, 
In that same context is also evidence for a type. So if you know Curry Howard, that's very appealing. Most people don't know Harry Curry Howard and find this very weird. So, so there was a lot of pushback against that. In the end, we, we settled on delegate. And I believe in the end it will not matter. So we just need a noun so that we have a name for this class of things. We can you saw me talking about delegates a lot. So that sort of is, a, is sort of a, a noun for, uh, for a class of concepts. Uh, so that must be a noun and uh, it must be easy to remember. So how do we get there? Uh, everything's different now. Um, so uh, the, the idea is that the current implicits are still supported in the next uh, major version of Scala in Scala 3.0. Um, so uh, that means that you can migrate uh, at your own pace. Uh, everything is still there. The cost is, of course, language duplication in the language. It's not so bad for the compiler because it turns out that these delegates, they essentially with all the improvements in the, in the polishing that we can, by and large, map them, delegates and implicits, into common concepts. Uh, implicits will probably be deprecated from a Scala 3, 1 on. So at some point, implicits will be deprecated and it will be only the delegates. And there are some special provisions made for cross-compilation. So one uh, thing is that if you want to use given as argument to make it clear that this is an implicit argument, you can use that already with old style Im implicits. And the other is if you want to use an import delegate to make it clear that you import, want to import delegates, that also works with old style implicit definitions. So taken together, these two things mean that you can actually migrate user code faster than a cross-compiling library. So you can keep a library with implicits for a long time on the old ones, but you can already pretend it's a new implicit in the user code, and then if most user code has migrated, then maybe the library can migrate as well. Okay, so you can try this out today. .edu.epfl.ch is the site, and thank you for listening, and uh, I think we have time for some questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. I will come with the mic. Many questions. <laughs> we have enough time. <laughs> so if implicits are to be supported in 3.0, can you mix and match implicits and delegates to ease the migration of client code? Uh, I, sorry, I... Uh, can you mix and match implicits and delegates in the same code base to ease the yes, migration? Yes, you can. You can yeah, so you yeah. can use delegates Even in the same, in same source file. Yeah, there's no mode bit. So it's just both, both are supported right now. This uh, stuff is awesome. Um, so do you, uh, can you say a little bit more about naming? Um, so if I have delegate int ord uh, for ordering int, um, is int ord a term? Can you say val x equals int ord and get yes. a handle to it? int ord is a term. OK, yeah. so and if I had something else called int ord, then there would be a conflict? Or is there some sort of? Uh, no, there would be a conflict. There would it be is, a conflict. It is a normal term. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, hi. There was a nice poster downstairs at the um, Scala Days conference uh, with uh, delegates or type classes and an annotation for the laws that those uh, structures obey. And wow, that struck me as like really, really nice to have like this information right where you have the definition of the type class. And I realize right now the, the story that we have is that uh, we have the, the Scala check stuff or the, the property stuff in a different package, and then we have some documentation on the website, uh, but nothing is integrated. So we, if we had like an annotation or some way to express laws with the delegates, and then Scala doc use, use that, then basically that would improve the usability a lot. Uh, what's your take on that? So you said you want an annotation on the type to say it's meant to be a type class. Is that what you? Oh, okay, for the laws, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be indeed, uh, I think that would be very interesting, but I believe we want to let it play a bit longer because there's a lot of movement in that space. And uh, uh, so I think, don't think we want to standardize too early, but uh, I definitely, I mean, it would be fantastic if we could do more with, uh, and then do property-based testing or, uh, or 
proving that the, that the laws hold. Both of, both of them should be possibilities, yeah. Um, Actually, there is a sort of, I mean, we, we, you, you can do a lot with insuring and requires and these sort of things. So, so there, there, there's syntactic space for that also with normal methods. Yeah. I have a question regarding migration. Yeah. Um, so there will be, as uh, we, you've said in the Scala days, there is a period where both mechanisms of both implicits and delegates uh, act in the same, can act in the same yes. uh, code base. And uh, in some, Dati uh, 3.1 will be only delegates, hopefully. But the, I, I believe what will happen is that um, implicits will be deprecated in 3.1. And I believe stay deprecated over the whole three cycle because uh, we want to re take essentially backwards compati compatibility much more seriously. So that means we can remove them only in 4.0. So that means it will be quite, quite a while until uh, that oh. they stay around. But of course, deprecated, so hopefully okay. the community will, uh, will move to the new question. So we discussed the possibility of uh, rewrite tools. Yes. But since implicit uh, you describe the mechanism, and with delegates, you describe the intent. Do yeah. you think it will be possible to create a rewrite tool from one to the other, uh, from the intent to the me from the mechanism to the intent? So, so some things are easier than others. Uh, so, we already already have in the compiler rewrite rules for uh, imports. Uh, so, the import delegate and and parameters. So that uh, essentially you just drop in a given in the in the argument. So those two things we have to recognize a bunch of implicit definitions and and uh, replace them by a delegate definition is um, also easy uh, as long as you keep as you map only to alias delegates then it's pretty straightforward for most of them. If you want it then to collapse into something nicer, then I. It would be harder. It would, it would require extensive pattern matching from the compiler, and probably it won't happen. So probably you will just essentially map them to something legal and then leave it to the user to, to rewrite it to something nicer of the same, with the same meaning. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, we can... Uh, use both implicit and delegates in new uh, Scala 3. Uh, will it be ambiguity if we use uh, implicit uh, uh, twice, uh, like uh, as we did before in this new Scala Ah, OK, company? yeah, yeah. That was, um, that was a proposition for a while, and it had very strong community support. Uh, I, I believe it would be a mistake because uh, it would, we would end up with just two more ways to define implicits. It would be very confusing to use the same. I mean, it, it is already confusing implicits having been used for conversions and, and parameters and, and all these different things. If you add more to it, you would just add to the confusion. So I, so, so I think it's important to have something which is really different. Uh, but even though it's for... For existing users like you are, it's it's a bigger hump to get over. So first, it looks strange. After after a while, it looks it will look quite natural. Is my prediction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, more what, questions one more can question be here. more questions can be handled in the uh, during the break. Okay. Good. Cool. Um, okay. okay. If it's a short question, then. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. So cool. let's handle it during the break. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks, Martin. Again. Thank you.